Welcome to Wilder. Today, I'm honored to be joined here by Dwayne Payton, who is not only one of the most prominent wildlife photography gear reviewers that I know on YouTube, but also an advocate for mental health and an icon for wildlife photography in the Australian outback. Dwayne, I'm super honored to have you on here today. Thanks for being here. Tell me a little bit about what your favorite camera pick was of 2023 and why. Uh, yeah, I, got, I had the pleasure of using a lot of gear, so I was pretty stoked to do that. A lot of Nikon and Sony and, and Canon, etc. But for me personally, when I reflect on it, I honestly think Nikon have made leaps and bounds in their cameras. So the Z8, which mm. was released, is absolutely incredible. They put the Z9, so the top of the range camera, they put the sensor out of that into the Z8, which competes with the R5. So you've got the stack sensor, which is amazing for wildlife. You've got high FPS, the autofocus was great. And when I was using that camera, I was just a little bit jealous, to be honest. I just thought <laughs> these specs are pretty amazing. Like, I'm not sure why they've done that. Obviously, they just want to make an impact in the market. But they've literally put a Z9 in this smaller body. And for wildlife, it's almost perfect. Uh, it's very, very good camera. Put that on some of the Nikon uh, light primes. And I honestly think the Z9, uh, Z8 sorry, is definitely leading the way for 2023. And I was so impressed with it. Hmm. Yeah, that's good to know. I feel like I've heard a lot of things about... Uh maybe some people um, worrying more about the Z8 was too close to the Z9 in some ways, but for you, you felt like it was maybe noticeable enough of a difference to make it stand out above the Z9 and kind of distinguish it enough, at least in regards to wildlife. I think the price is the obvious thing. Yeah. Um, so the Z9 is, is quite a bit more expensive and you have to question, is it worth that extra mm. money? Well, the build quality, et cetera. And it's a very heavy body. If you've ever held the Z9, it's a monster of a camera. Yeah. And at least the Z8's got that smaller form factor if that's what you want. You can obviously put a grip on it as well. But I think in the price point, that it is, it offers really, really good specs. So that's mm. why I think it's it's good. It's, it's just the value for money. So no rolling shutter or very little rolling shutter in a camera that sort of price is what makes it stand out in my opinion. Um, it's just, I was very impressed with it, that's for sure. Yeah, yeah, that is a huge perk to that Z9 or some of the more recent Sony flagships that have been put out. And those rolling shutters are just awesome. Seeing that on electronic I forget. Sometimes they're like hybrid names that aren't technically, you know, they're, they're called electronic, but essentially a lot of those electronic shutters, that's changing the game a lot. So. Oh, for sure. Without a doubt. 100%. Yeah. Yeah. Later in this conversation, I want to jump um, a little bit more into uh, talking about mental health because that's something you talk about on your channel quite a bit. And um, I've loved yeah. seeing a lot of um, and how that's kind of changed your life. Um, but for now, I want to sit a little bit more on gear um, and talk about some sure. of that, as I think some of the perspectives you have and experiences are quite valuable. What's the most um, maybe overrated and underrated features that you hear about being talked about in the wildlife photography community when it comes to gear? Uh, it's a tricky one. I, I think for me, originally it was flash, like probably not so much today, but when I started, everyone seemed to be using flash mm. with their wildlife photography. And I thought, oh, I'm definitely going to have to get a flash because I want to be like them. I want to be good, <laughs> you know. So uh, so I bought the flash and this big beamer and those brackets and set it all up. And then I quickly figured out that I hate flash. <laughs> I didn't really understand it. And uh, I just found it annoying and just got in the way and I never really used it. So it has its purpose. If you want to be creative or if you're in a dark rainforest or the birds really lacking it, but it just takes a little bit of setup. I know with hummingbirds, etc., they use multiple flash, but for me and my style, I thought flash was overrated. Mm -hmm. um, the next thing is probably, it could be it's a tricky one to say it's it's overrated, but I think I put too much emphasis on big primes. So I purchased the big 500 F4, you've got the 600 F4. These are big, mm -hmm. expensive primes that everybody wants and they believe they're the very best lenses you can get. And there's no doubt these lenses are amazing and the image quality you get from them is second to none. Mm. However, I don't think you necessarily have to have one of those to enjoy wildlife photography or get nice shots. It wasn't until I actually got a zoom lens, so if we're talking about underrated gear, I think a, a sort of a zoom like a Canon 100 to 500 or a Sony 100 to 400 or whatever one at that range, I think opens up a lot of possibilities that mm. we overlook because we're always chasing focal length. We're always more and more focal length, <laughs> and it's true to an extent, and I agree with that. However, we can't ignore. The wider stuff like you can get such unique interesting shots with a zoom lens it's 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 completely under under 
rated. rated. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> it's, 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 it's underrated because I think we need to have both, to be fair. Uh, yeah. You need these zoom lenses just to go wider and just to look in your environment and look in your habitat. A prime lens sort of fixes you at a certain focal length and it's harder to be creative. Mm -hmm. So I think that would be my answer. I think uh, zoom lenses are underrated. Uh, the big primes are possibly mm. overrated and maybe a little bit of flash. That's where I'm going with that question. Um, in terms of actual specs on cameras, uh, some cameras can definitely bombard you with, you know, this spec and that spec and just how important are they? It's debatable, I suppose, you know, like mm. 8K video. I've never used 8K video, mm. um, you know, and then sometimes Canon mentioned their um, pre-capture, but it's extremely difficult to use. So mm. you, you've got to be mm -hmm. careful that some of these brands will bombard you, but how useful are they? So I think it's important that you watch reviews or, or figure out is it just marketing or is it actually mm. has a use case in the field? Yeah, yeah, I get that. That's interesting. Yeah, like um, I really love um, OM Systems or Panasonic Lumix's uh, pre-burst. Um, I haven't personally oh, yes. used Canon's um, pre-bursts. I forget what they call it. But um, yeah, but I've heard from many people that it's just incredibly inconvenient to use. So that's interesting Very. that you bring that up. Yeah, and, and then I think... I think Sorry to interrupt you. I think Nikon doesn't actually shoot pre-capture in RAW yet. So yep. um, so they're all, all doing it slightly differently. Um, yeah. The Sony A9 III that I just used, that had probably the best pre-capture. But OM Systems and mm. Panasonic's very good as well. Yeah. And I love that you were talking about uh, zoom lenses. That's a... Uh, like for me, in the types of stories that I like to create, I've learned over time that um, I don't... It, it just doesn't suit my type of... Uh, I guess the type of art that I do, it doesn't suit it to be focused on using uh, super telephoto primes all the time. Um, mm -hmm. Because I'm wanting, in my stories that I tell, I like to get the whole context of like, here's the wide scene and then here's the tight scene, mm -hmm. right? So having that ability mm -hmm. to zoom in and out is like fundamental, I've realized, to the types of stories that I create. And um, mm -hmm. so having a zoom lens is just what fits for me. And um, I love that sure. you bring that up. And actually recently, like I've been... Uh, anyone who follows me knows that I've been kind of become obsessed with those wide angles. And now I shoot like <laughs> literally in the past six months, I think I have shot over 50 or 60% of my wildlife photos at 200 millimeters and below, like an incredible wow. amount. And mostly on right. uh, the uh, either a Sigma 135 prime, 1.8 prime or a yeah. the Sigma 70 to 200 millimeter 2.8 prime. Um, mm -hmm. and I have just love been loving using that because it's like totally switched <laughs> up my perspective, given me a fresh yep. new kind of like lens to look through the world with and, mm -hmm. um, being at that low of an F-stop, even at those wider focal lengths gives you just such a, a well isolated scene on that subject with still getting mm -hmm. all of those elements around it that I've just fallen sure. in love with that. So love that you brought some of that up. <laughs> Yeah, for sure. What What do you think are maybe, um, so, you know, you have your main cameras and lenses that people are always talking about, but what are maybe some main wildlife photography accessories that you think more sh people should be using that maybe they don't use very often? I think if anyone's watched my channel, I probably mentioned them a few times and I, I did a recent video on it. So it's a good question. I think for me, if I reflect on what I still use today that I purchased years ago, or what am I still using? You know, what's in my mm. everyday kit that I always go back to? Um, and probably the one I go on about the most is, you can see that there, yep, is yep. This, uh, gr the old ground pod, which I've mentioned <laughs> numerous times. Um, Love that. Just a bit of hard plastic, which obviously goes on the ground and your camera goes on this. It's just to get that perspective. Now you don't need to purchase an expensive ground pod like this you can make your own you can use a frying pan it's basically just to get you down low so i think um, some sort of shooting angle you can even use like i've recently got hold of one of these mini tripods mm. um, i think su ray make them or i footage and they come with a monopod sometimes it just can be quite handy you can just put your camera on top of this you know and just carry it around and plop it down and then shoot if that's what you want so i, I found these mini tripods quite useful um, good for filming too like mm. if you just want to film down low you can just put your camera on there and and start filming so these mini tripods are pretty cool and then uh something that i use oh 
still uses this thing called a bag hide. It's a bit hard to see it here, but mm. this folds into quite a small thing and then you just throw it over yourself for a bit of camo if you're in the field. So you don't need a bag like one of those big hides. So you don't need to carry like those tents and set it up. Mm. You can just use this, throw it over yourself and then start shooting. So those are probably the main things. Oh, and, and something we probably don't think about as often as the clothing that we wear. Um, so I use muck boots or gum boots or wellies, whatever you want to call them. I never thought I would wear them that often because they can be a little bit hot in summer, but I just find them brilliant because I don't need to worry about the water. I don't need mm. to worry about the grass and seeds and things getting in there, the mud. Um, I don't have to worry about the snakes as much down here. Um, <laughs> so an Australia think, problem. Uh, good, <laughs> yeah. Australian problem. I mean, you get snakes where you are too, I think. But, <laughs> yeah. um, but, I th but good quality boots and then rain jacket, like wet weather gear if you want to mm. get down low and get dirty. So... Those are kind of the things that I use all the time um, and have no regrets uh, purchasing those things. So those are kind of the accessories I think are important to me anyway. There's probably more than that. It's hard to remember exactly which totally. ones, but though, what about you? Yeah, I mean- What are you for? That ground pod I think is very, very helpful. It doesn't, uh, most of the scenarios I find myself photographing in locally, unfortunately it doesn't help out too much. Um, but the occasional times where I do get to go over to the coast and do shorebirds or stuff like that, yes, just awesome. Ideal. Awesome. I love yeah. that piece of gear. And even though, like you said, you could make it at home, I do like that ground pod that they've built because it's so much lighter, you know, than if you were to do a frying yes. pan or something. Yeah. hundred percent. Um, yeah. so I love that piece of, uh, equipment that you mentioned. Um, yeah, beyond that, I'm trying to think what other accessories. I feel like I have definitely trimmed down the amount of accessories that I use over time. But, I mean, like you said, having a good pair of boots, I mean, feels super essential now. I used to try to yeah. do, you know, cheapo, you know, $50 boots all the time. And yeah, now yeah, it's yeah. like ever since I got my pair of, you know, $200 boots, I'm like, those things rock. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. It just makes your life a bit easier. Yeah. That's for sure. And, so and much if you're out in the field all the time. Yep. It's, it's, it's helpful. Yep, totally. So, sunscreen as well. Sunscreen. True. Yeah. <laughs> or a hat. <laughs> a good not, hat. Yeah. Not, yeah, not really an accessory, I suppose. But in the Australian sun, um, mm. yeah, it, if you don't have sunscreen, you're in trouble, that's for sure. Yeah. Um, just get burnt quickly. <laughs> yep, totally. Well, thank you for sharing all your valuable perspectives on gear and uh, your wide uh, experience across a bunch of different brands and types of uh, gear has been incredibly valuable. So something that we're going to be doing is Dwayne's going to be sharing on our brand new Wilder Leaflet newsletter about the three biggest things that he looks out for when he's looking into purchasing camera gear and um, kind of sharing a little bit about what he thinks are the most valuable and important things to be looking into. So uh, make sure you guys check out the new newsletter if you haven't already, and uh, Dwayne will be featured on there. One of my favorite events you host each year is um, your wildlife photography camera and lens awards. Um, yes. With so much uh, competition in current day, like I feel like brands and stuff, there's just so much gear being flooded into the market, it feels like all the time, and so much to consider. Um, what is, what makes you confident? Like when you're going through so many different pieces of gear, what makes you confident in the results of kind of when you present them? <laughs> yeah, it's, a, it's a very question. good question. <laughs> no, no, it's, it's, it's a good question. And I think it's just all subjective that, that yeah. video I do is mostly fun. It's just a bit of fun. And mm -hmm. it's just like any awards, I think it ultimately comes down to your perspective and everybody will be different and everyone will have a different opinion. And that video is just my opinion based on the gear that I've used. So I'm very lucky to use a lot of gear throughout the year. And it's just which ones pop into my mind as oh, I, I enjoyed using that or that was really cool, that feature of like the Z8, for example, or the R5 that just keeps on, keeps on going, you know, it just mm. keeps on impressing me. And the Sony does really well. And then we get new lenses like the 200 to 800, which sort of break the mold. So mm. um, there's definitely some that are underrepresented. I haven't used Fuji yet. So, you know, there's some things I haven't used. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think through my experience, I just remember what made me smile, <laughs> what did I enjoy using, mm. and what did I think was unique or different or interesting. So, um, you know, you don't have to agree with me. It's just my perspective. And totally. I have a lot of fun doing it because it's just a great reminder <laughs> of, you know, what's come during the year or what even older gear, you know, what gear are we still using? You don't have to get new gear. So it can be the gear that's stood the test of time, so to speak. Um, but yeah, it is a little bit overwhelming, to be honest, how much gear gets released. <laughs> and I don't see it slowing up anytime soon. That's for sure. Yeah, most definitely. Especially with more and more access to online social media and all that stuff. It just sure. got to keep going. Yep. 
most definitely. So what's sure. what's your personal go to camera setup then? If you had to say, because uh, obviously you're testing out a ton of stuff all the time, or you're yes. trying new stuff out, and you probably have a plethora of options to choose from. If you had to pick just one yeah. camera lens combo, what's your go to? Oh, good. Yeah, it's tricky. So the two th- for, from the gear that I own. So for the gear that I own, if I want the best image quality, I'm going with the R5 and my 500 f4 prime with 1.4 converter. Mm. So 705.6. So that's if I want the very best quality, I'll go for that. Mm. Um, if I am just um, in the car going for a drive and I don't want to pull out my big heavy lens and I just want a camera next to me, it's probably the 200 to 800, the mm. new lens from Canon and the R5. It's just a great kit, plenty of focal length. It's right there. Um, in terms of fun, like if I just want a bit of fun on a camera that makes me smile is the OM-1 and the 300 f4 prime. Mm. There's something about that kit, hmm. which it's nice and light yeah. and it, I just love using it. So it's a super sharp lens. It's just a fun kit to use. So um, the kit that makes me smile is definitely that OM-1. Hmm. Uh, if I'm doing like um, reptiles or butterflies or any of that sort of more intimate type things or just Wildlife as well, the 100 to 500, the Canon mm. is a beautiful lens. Um, I don't mind reaching for that. In terms of the, like if, if money was no object, um, I think the Nikon 600 F4 with the built-in 1.4, that's mm. a really exciting lens for IQ. Um, and then obviously the Z9 is a good attached to that. In terms of sports or action, if I wanted to freeze the action, the new Sony A9 III is just 120 frames per second mm-hmm. uh, they've got mm-hmm. pre-capture it's pretty incredible um, I could go on and on but <laughs> I know I've probably over answered your question there but yeah. for me it's it's more what am I doing um, like what am I photographing where am I going and it's there's no real one system or one lens that does mm-hmm. everything and that's probably what I've figured out over the years is that you really need a bit of diversity you need mm-hmm. a zoom lens you need a prime lens um, and I think something I could have mentioned about the uh, underrated is the weight. So I think something people don't necessarily understand or put enough emphasis on is the weight of your kit. Because if you're hand holding something like this, which is around 2.7 kilos, um, after a while it can get quite heavy. And if you're not used to this sort of weight, it can it can impact your enjoyment. Like mm. if you're constantly going, oh, this is just too heavy. Um, and that's probably why Micro Four Thirds is very popular with some birders and things. It's just the weight. So before you run out and get a really old 500 millimeter prime lens that weighs four kilos, you have yeah. to think about the impact of that weight. So, um, you know, there's a lot of factors, I suppose, but um, those are the sort of, that's the sort of gear that I'm enjoying using at the moment. Yeah, that, uh, you mentioned like uh, the Olympus 300 millimeter F4 prime. That lens, yeah. there is something incredibly <laughs> fun about that lens, I'd agree with you. Like, um, yeah, it just like I don't know if it's like there's just so many little small older kind of like more out of date now yeah. features about it that make it very fun to hold. And those out of date features aren't bad. They just aren't maybe like the standard anymore. Maybe what's this trending as much sure. that makes it very fun. And I do think you bring up an interesting point of like, I guess maybe a question is for you, how do you balance that um finding enjoyment and getting like the best quality shot you possibly can, right? At all costs, even if that's like yeah. some of your personal, you know, suffering at the moment, carrying the heavier piece of gear versus yeah. get it like taking something lighter out and having maybe more fun out in the field, but maybe knowing that you're going to get, you know, 10% of a softer image than if you could have, you know, brought up, brought out the best, you know, lens that you own. What do you do? kind of find yourself struggling with that balance much do you i don't know uh, do you have kind of like a way it's, that you generally operate yeah it's a, it's a great question to be honest and there is a trade-off like it and again it, and it depends on what you're doing um i must admit i enjoy my prime if i'm laying down low so shorebirds anything where i'm stationary for a longer period of time i'll generally go to my prime um, mm. because it's just it's I don't have to carry it as far or move around but if I'm walking through the bush or I'm changing it's just too it's too heavy it's just a pain to carry that and then maybe a tripod at the same time it's just too 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 painful so yeah. I'll just grab the 200 800 or um, another lens 
but you know there's no denying that those big primes are the way to go and that's probably why Nikon have released though the 600 pf and the 800 pf you can handhold those big primes yeah um because they're very light and so they're very unique lenses and i've got friends with the 800 6.3 and they love it like i had one mate went into indonesia or uh, in uh, rainforest like you know really dark conditions and yeah. he was hand holding his z9 and <laughs> 800 and everyone else is lugging these big heavy primes and tripods and he's just brr, 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 yeah <laughs> and getting these amazing shots so yeah. um you know th there's there's definitely that trade-off isn't there and it all depends i guess on, on what you shoot so for me it depends where i'm going um, it depends what I'm doing and if I'm being completely honest because I'm reviewing so much gear I, I often don't get a day out just for myself mm, um, totally. <laughs> where I can just can choose what I want uh, which is a, which is a shame but um, for me yeah it's changed it really has like if I think how many times I've used my prime in the last year it wouldn't be all that often to be honest it'd only be a handful of times mm. the rest of the time it's been zoom lenses and other lenses so uh, it's a tricky question to answer yeah it depends where you're going and what you're traveling and i i, I think you're right in that um do you want to be happy and <laughs> enjoying yourself <laughs> or you know so uh it's, it's a trade-off there's no denying the big prime the quality you get from them is just beautiful and every time i use it i'm like oh this is so good but yeah it's just can i be bothered with the weight of it <laughs> yeah yeah i was um that was a pretty big shock to me um with the um the new sigma 500 millimeter 5.6 came out how light that thing is that thing is right insanely light like lighter than all my zoom full frame zoom lenses that i own oh wow um it was it's as light as um <clears throat> i'm trying to remember trying to remember all the specs off the top of my head but it was i think it was as light as the olympus 300 millimeter f4 uh that oh, wow. you know tried last year um just incredibly light but then i was thinking in my brain i'm like okay so this this lens is incredibly light it's a full frame lens um and it's a 5.6 and i was like there's got to be some image sharpness being sacrificed here but i was pretty surprised to see that in editing like pulling all of it up i was like this looks like it was shot with you know like your typical standard yeah, yeah. super telephoto prime on full frame so yeah that was a pretty big surprise to me but um there was no doubt for me taking that out in the field it was like oh this is fun to walk around with this this doesn't feel like a burden as opposed to maybe bigger primes that I've uh, tried before as well. So there's some yeah, value. Couldn't to that. agree more. Yeah, <laughs> I agree. The, the, when I used the Nikon 600 6.3, it was just for bird and flight. It was just magic to have that weight and be able to move it around. Um, yeah, they're, they're doing wonders. And to be honest, it's been a while since I've shot with a soft lens. <laughs> like I think yeah. we're getting pretty, <laughs> spoiled you know, now. all the lenses. Yeah, spoiled for sure. So I think the lenses are all getting so good. And now that doing different things aren't they they think how can we be different is it is it weight is it focal mm. length is it the trying is it into uh, built-in teleconverters there's they're all trying and it's exciting to yeah. see what's coming that's for sure yeah the competition is making it really good <laughs> mm -hmm. yep without doubt so I want to dive a little bit more now into your personal story and maybe a little bit about the Australian outback I know you've talked about it uh, in a past video, but can you share a little bit about how your wildlife photography journey kind of started and uh, you got into wildlife photography? Yeah, no worries for anyone who hasn't heard it. Um, apologize to anyone who has, but uh, I grew <laughs> up in New Zealand, so born and bred in New Zealand. Didn't really have any interest in birds or wildlife. I knew the birds of New Zealand, you know, the ki kias and uh, kiwis and a few unique New Zealand birds, but didn't really have a passing interest in it. No interest in photography or birds. Moved to Australia, been here about 20 one years joined the police force spent a number of years in the police um, and then during uh, I think I'd worked a night shift I for whatever reason I had a cardiac arrest so my heart stopped and uh, it was a pretty scary thing my, luckily my wife was home and she did CPR and uh, yeah. I was unconscious and I had a number of cardiac arrests ended up getting flown up to uh, intensive care up in Sydney and I was in hospital for a number of weeks um, whilst they try to figure out what was going on um, I now have a defibrillator in my chest which will um, go off if I have another cardiac arrest unfortunately I had another six cardiac arrests out of hospital after the first one thankfully touch wood I haven't had one for a while yeah. Um, but yeah so that was kind of a scary situation and uh, pretty traumatic for everybody involved but part of my recovery was to go for a walk in the bush or the woodland and the doctor said 
because I hadn't, I'd lost a lot of strength in my legs and things. So I needed to start walking and getting some exercise. So, you know, just wandering through the Australian bush, as we call it, uh, I noticed a few birds and I thought, oh, they're pretty cool. Hmm. Didn't take too much notice of it. But my wife had a 40D, like an old camera, and we had a 70 to 200 to photograph pets, I think. So she was sort of taking the photos. I had dabbled in it, but nothing serious. I didn't really know what I was doing. Um, so I just took that camera and that lens on a walk with me and uh, Australian magpie, which is slightly different to other magpies around the world, landed on a fence post, took a photo, looked on the back of the camera and thought, that's pretty cool. <laughs> um, you know, quite a bit of detail there and just started walking, took the camera with me. And then I noticed another little yellow bird and I thought, Oh, I wonder what that is. I've got no idea. And then another different bird, and, hmm. you know, and then I saw a galar and I saw a rosella and I was just taking photos of these different birds and um, something in my brain sort of wanted to figure out what they were. So uh, I've got a bird book and uh, as many people do, and you're flicking through the bird book and it's very difficult if you don't know the families to figure out what a bird is. Yeah. Um, and I couldn't, yeah, I couldn't figure out what a few of these birds were. So of course I went online <laughs> And I think I found a forum, um, pre-social media that we know today. It was a lot of message boards back in the day. And uh, I think I went on one of those message boards and just put up this bad photo saying, oh, what is this? And then somebody <laughs> would tell me what it was, you know. Um, and uh, it just sort of started snowballing. And then, of course, I'm interested in birds and I start seeing these photos by other people and I start thinking, well, oh, wow, their photos are really good and mine are really bad. <laughs> like, why am I photos so bad and I wanted to take better photos so um, something clicked and I just went down this rabbit hole basically of um, wanting to improve my photos wanting to you know learn more about birds and photography and and something clicked and we'll probably talk about mental health a bit later and that's probably why I did it but um, once I got into it I bought you know a new camera a new lens and then for the next year after I got addicted I was in the field every chance I got <laughs> so you know this was back in 2011 2012 I think in my first year I went out into the field close to a hundred times wow like a hundred days wow in the year so pretty much every third day I had that camera and I was out there just photographing whatever I could see and um, look I haven't really stopped since so very very lucky that I found this hobby or this passion and um, I think everyone comes in it, into it in a different way, you know. Um, mm -hmm. I'm curious, how did you get into birds? Was it from young or parents or what, what was it for you? Yeah, I had a, I had an experience where um, I guess growing up, I had a little bit of like nature, a love for nature instilled in me um, with my parents, but never, never too much. And actually, I kind of went through a phase where I just kind of rebelled against all of it. <laughs> um, <laughs> and I was like, I'm so sick of this, like, you know, like all yeah. that stuff. Um but in college, I was studying abroad in Costa Rica. <clears throat> oh, wow. And so I was uh, living in Costa Rica for a half year. And uh, we would always get the chance to go out and go on like weekend trips in between our studies and the work that we were doing down there. And um, I was already into um, uh, photography very much so at that point. And mostly... Um, mostly doing other things, but I also did like occasionally doing like a nice landscape shot. So in Costa Rica, you know, I'd go around and try to look for a good landscape shot. And through a series of three events um, where the first event was, um, I was walking around in the morning, you know, looking around, I was like, ah, eh, like let's, birds are supposed to be a thing here in Costa Rica. So let's see what birds we could find. I'm just looking around and, you know, seeing a few birds, try to photograph them. And I see um, what's called a lessons mot mot. Uh, fly up just on a perch right in front of me. And I don't know if you're familiar with the bird, but just a stunning tropical bird that has um, two twin feathers that kind of like has a tail. And then it has two twin feathers that drop even further below that initial tail with just balls right. on the end of it, like little feather balls almost. Yeah, and yeah. it looks like it's a pendulum and it'll just stand in front of you and just look straight at you and just swing its tail like a pendulum. And it's just incredibly wow. mesmerizing. And so it like flew up six feet in front of me, just was like right there and just looking at me and doing that. And I was like, whoa, that's pretty cool. So that was kind of the first initial noticing of birds. And then um, after that, had um, two other experiences that were incredibly impactful. One with being um, kind of like um, 
uh, a dream bird. So most most all my life, scarlet macaws um, were a bird that felt oh, yes. like, you know, they were in textbooks that I would read, but they felt like almost like a fantasy, like they weren't real. So seeing um, them in real life was incredible. Um, and seeing them at one night, like 200 of them fly overhead at sunset wow. was just an incredible experience um, that got me further into it. And then lastly, there is an experience where I, in my last month in Costa Rica, um, I went on a bir birding tour one morning with a guide and didn't really think it was going to be that enjoyable. But then I was just fascinated by everything you knew. And I was just like, how can you know where every bird is going to be in the morning and all that stuff? He's like, yeah, yeah if we go here, we'll see these birds. If we go there, we'll see this yeah. birds at exactly this time. This bird's going to come out. And all that happened, I was just like, what? <laughs> so, um, yeah. Yeah, that's uh that's definitely what got me into uh birds and wildlife photography. But <laughs> Yeah. No, it's I think it's the that shared uh joy. I guess it's that feedback loop, isn't it? It's that dopamine, you know, you try something, you get a bit of feedback, you yep. think, Oh, this is fun, you do it again, you get more reward. So it's just this process then once you start it's very hard to stop because you're sort of get that reward from it and it's great to hear your story and i'm sure many others that listen are probably exactly the same there's a distinctive moment or something yep. that's happened that's got them into birds and uh if only more people could experience that um it'd be great <laughs> yeah yeah most definitely and usually like you said i feel like people who really get into it they have that like for the first two or three years they get into it really hard like what you're saying going out a hundred <laughs> yeah. times in your first year i didn't count i don't know if i went out a hundred times but I definitely went pretty, pretty at it that first, like the first two or three years as well. And like, I think my third, second year being really into it, I tried to do like a big year. Um, oh, yeah. And I set the record for like my county on eBird, you know, like that's that's the type of level <laughs> that I was like, I'm going to do this and like, yeah. I'm going to see everything. Yeah, and, sure. Yeah. So yeah. I love that. What was uh for you? What was it, uh, it that inspired you to head from just doing wildlife photography as a you know as a pure like just uh photography hobby into moving into the youtube space and starting to create content there and all of that yeah it's it's interesting it's probably not something i really thought but um i've already mentioned him once but uh thomas heaton is the landscape yep. guy he's in the uk and i started following him like years and years ago when he very first started i think he was just shooting on an iphone he was just going out into the field and i really enjoyed his content and he shared what he was thinking and I was thinking, you know, a lot of people have been very helpful to me over the years and sharing their knowledge with me. I thought, well, perhaps I could do something similar. Maybe I could create a video and mm. just share with people how I go about doing what I'm doing. No expectation. And just thought, you know, this might be helpful. People might enjoy that. Um, I did actually shoot a video. You know, I think all, many people are scared to go on YouTube. Like they think, oh, you know, I was. Yeah. I, I didn't want to do it. I put it off. Like I had the thought well before I started. And I even shot um, a couple of videos, you know, and edited them and then thought, oh, no, I won't release them. Uh, you know, just <laughs> chickened out, I suppose. And then my good mate Jan started his channel and I saw how well he was doing and he gave me some encouragement. I thought, oh, why not? I'll give it a go. And, mm. and so, you know, I just started and uh, that was I think it was four or five years ago I forget exactly how long ago it was but um, and yeah it's just sort of snowballed I suppose it was I enjoyed the creative process it made me think more it made me learn a lot is something I'm yeah. not an expert I've never been an expert uh, I, I'm just an old bloke that likes taking photos of birds <laughs> so uh, I've definitely learned a lot I've got a lot wrong and people are quick to tell you in the comments oh, whether yeah. you've got it wrong so <laughs> I appreciate that um, so look I think when you teach or when you share you actually get a lot of benefit from that as well. Mm. So um, it's not just me creating content because I want to make money or anything like that. It's it's the shared experience. I get to learn. I get to help others. They can help me. And we can sort of grow as that community and just share that passion. So, um, you know, that's my reasons, I suppose, for, for getting into it is just to give a little bit back and to and because I enjoy the creative process. I was getting a little bit stale with just taking photos of birds, you know, when you've been doing it for so long, you you want something different. So I think YouTube was more just in another creative outlet to enjoy for me. Mm. Um, I'm not sure if it's the same for you, but it's it's definitely a, a different creative outlet. Yeah, well, um, I think that's awesome because it reflects a lot of like, you know, uh, the way that you described yourself right now reflects, I feel like, how you do your content. Like, you know, even earlier we were talking about uh, with your gear reviews, you had mentioned that 
you like to kind of do the in the field experience and just kind of talk about it a little bit more um, on a personal experience level, right? And so that reflects sure. exactly what everything you've been talking about there. And so that's mm-hmm. super cool. Um, that that's how uh, that's how it works for you. And <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, I love a lot of the stuff you create. Recently, I've been seeing more of your stuff where you'll kind of. Um, um, well, talk about mental health more or talk about something that's a little bit more motivational or inspirational. Um, And I wanted to read a little monologue from a recent video of yours that I really enjoyed. Um, So yeah, I'll I'll go ahead and read that. Ultimately for me, I need to deal with an escape, some way to escape from reality for a little while. We all have different things that we're dealing with. And for me, I need to put my time, my passion, my energy into. When I'm out there and watching the sun come up and I'm thinking, where is everyone else? I can't help but think that if people want to help their mental health, if you can get out into nature to live it, breathe it and experience it, for me, it helps me to be a better person. I thought that was really, uh, I guess, captivating uh, reading that. And um, I loved your drone visual along with it, by the way. (laughs) (laughs) Um, But uh, yeah, um, have you been able to pinpoint, I guess, specifically, because you've been talking about, you know, how wildlife photography was this escape for you and something to pour yourself into coming out of the cardiac arrests and all those things you experienced. Have you been able to pinpoint what specifically it is about being out in nature and doing wildlife photography that draws you back to it time and time again? I think it's, it's, it's a couple of factors. I think it's the, um, the, there's a couple of things. It's more the flow state. I don't know if you, you would experience this and everybody knows what this is. It's when you get so involved with something, everything else disappears. Your inner negative voice just disappears. Yeah. Everything, every worry seems to disappear. Your stress, your anxiety, you're focused, and I don't know if it's because you're looking through this viewfinder, you've mm-hmm. got this intimate intimate view of the world, like you're in your own personal documentary, mm-hmm. you're in this little world, and you're watching birds go about their business, they don't care about what people think, or what your last YouTube video did, or your social <laughs> media following, <laughs> they're just going about their business, they're just feeding, or preening, or doing whatever, and it's the serenity of it. Like for me here in Australia, at least, you know, I get up early, I see the sun coming up, it's refreshing. And I, I don't know what's happening. There could be birds, there could be kangaroos, there could be a whole range of things. And it's that unknown. And I don't know if it's the smells, the the sounds, like mm. when you're in the bush and you hear these birds chirping and, and different things going on, it's like, I don't know whether it's a, a throwback to yesteryear as humans, you know, it's just something about it that, removes me from reality for a second i know Mm. different people escape from reality in different ways whether that be drugs or alcohol or some sort of addiction i think i'm just very very lucky that i found photography as my escape um and i think it's a healthy escape um Mm -hmm. to to do that so um i think anyone who suffers from mental health and you want an escape i think getting out in nature is definitely one way to do that um and to focus on something whether that's with binoculars or a camera is very very beneficial so for me it's just that feed i just feel good like i get this yeah. euphoric almost feeling like after a session like i could be out in the field for say three hours generally in the morning so i'll get there as the sun's coming up and then photograph for two or three hours and during that time i'm not thinking about anything else mm-hmm. and that's pretty incredible and then after that session i'm like wow this feels amazing you know <laughs> i feel really good and i'll often either call my wife and say oh I've had a great morning or if I'm with someone we'll go and have a cup of coffee and we'll chat over the coffee and we can talk about the photos that we got and Mm. reflect on the time so Mm. um, yeah for me it's just that escape I suppose the the ability just to focus on something and and I get a lot of joy from um, the process I love the taking good photos don't get me wrong Um, but I I, I enjoy that process almost as much as I do the finished product so Mm. uh, it's definitely good for me for my mental health and my well-being and i'm sure it is for many other people and that's probably why other people do it as well yeah yeah i love that there's um i i love both sides of i love the digital and like content creation and management and uh uh, (laughs) analytics and connecting with people and all that aspect of things it's very digital and very uh I don't know if manufactured is the right word maybe not manufactured but very digital and very um very connected, right? But then there's something really, really cool about wildlife photography when you're out in the field. You mentioned like you're looking through this viewfinder and you're looking at maybe a bird, right? And the bird like doesn't, you know, well, 
I shouldn't say, I guess if you're stressing out the bird or something like that, that's a whole different conversation. But in general, yeah, the bird doesn't care that you're there. Like they are doing their yeah. thing and you're, there's something special about the fact that you are just witnessing the world the way yes. it is that um, is yes. incredibly refreshing and kind of takes you out of your own problems where it's like yes. sometimes you get so consumed with your problems and what's going on in life that you need something that is just going to kind of like re reorient you to help you like almost like maybe realize or remember that you're maybe not, maybe your problem isn't quite as significant as you think it is maybe, or maybe it's, you know, you know, you aren't, you aren't the end all be all in the world, right? There's a world that exists without you. And there's so much beauty in the world, regardless of you being in there and you're just enhancing, you know, uh, that. And so, uh, yeah, I love that you, uh, mentioned that. And I think that that's really good. Um, is there anything that I guess with your mental health struggles that you've gone through, um, or any experience that you have that you could share on a podcast like this today that might help anyone listening to, uh, the podcast? Yeah, I think, um, so for me, I was obviously in the police for a number of years, cardiac arrest. And I think when you get to my age, I think you'd be pretty unique if you haven't suffered some sort of trauma. So mm. I think nearly every human has some sort of trauma that they're dealing with and yeah. may trigger different things. Um, for me, uh, I just want to be honest, I guess, is that even though I've been doing this for a long time and I have a lot of photos that people tell me are good and that I still have doubts, I still have a negative talk in my head that I'm I'm not that good and I don't know what I'm doing. So sometimes mm. I struggle with that a little bit um, where, you know, I think, oh, gee, I'm, will people really listen to me? I don't know why this happens, but sometimes I just get this negative self-talk if that uh, I'm not good enough. But I think with photography, I, I'd sort of just say, Yes, my inner voice might be telling me those things, but I've got evidence to say otherwise. Mm. And I just push through and I say, like, what I'm going to do, even if I don't get anything good, it's okay. The point is to get out and to jump in my car, go out there and just see what happens. And often, you know, something might not be happening and I'll be thinking, oh, no, I need to get some shots. If I just relax and enjoy myself, more times than not, I'll get a, fo a photo. So I think you just can't be too critical of yourself and I'm guilty of this, so I, I, I struggle with it. It's just we need to be a bit easier on ourselves and just sort of trust the process and just enjoy yourself instead of um, worrying so much about, you know, what other people think. Mm. I think for me, I think, I've mentioned this before, but I got caught up in the um, Instagram, social media feedback loop where I thought I needed to get shots for social media and that didn't, that wasn't helpful to me at all. So, mm. you know, I'd go out into the field and I'd be thinking all the time, I need a shot for Instagram. I need a shot. And if I didn't get that shot, I'd be disappointed and you'd go home partially upset. Whereas I thought, no, um, I'm going out for me first. I'm going to enjoy the process. If I get a shot, great. If I don't, it's not a major. So it's mm. just, you know, I guess it's the process, isn't it? It's trying to just enjoy that process and get out there and do it. Even if you're not feeling that great, I think getting out there will definitely help you regardless. So um, mm. hopefully that kind of answers that. And I'm definitely not a <laughs> professional or anything like that. I think, <laughs> you know, I just, uh, if you do have that negative talk and that anxiety, I find in the field reduces those symptoms for me. Um, I couldn't tell you exactly why that is. I guess it's just um, quietening that voice by being busy, I suppose. When you're not busy, you're, you're brain can tick over can't it so the busier you are and the more you're doing the quieter everything gets so yeah hopefully that answers that <laughs> yeah well i appreciate you sharing that and um yeah i guess just to be uh an encouragement to you i feel like uh i mean first of all um what you put out and produce is um awesome it's incredibly uh, uh at times inspirational and um you know when you're talking about gear <laughs> i think your experiences are very uh, valuable and the way you present them are great i think a lot of the reason why people follow you is because you are a very down to earth type of person at least that's how it portrays mm -hmm. on camera obviously we've never yeah. met in person so you could be just you know <laughs> totally faking all of us uh but no, uh no, no. Yeah, you're a very down to earth person. You present so, and I think that a lot of people can relate to that. So, um, oh, yeah. Good. So glad to hear it. So, being uh, someone from the United States myself, uh, I love watching uh, the different scenes and scenarios you get to be in because you're in Australia. What do you think is special about doing wildlife photography where you're from in Australia? Uh, I think it's 
unique in the size of the country. I think people underestimate just how big Australia is. I guess it's like the US, I suppose. It's just enormous and you have so many different habitats. I think um, people think of Australia that's kind of synonymous with desert, you know, dry, barren, mm. hot, snakes, crocodiles, <laughs> and all those things. Jeff and look, they do Steve exist. Irwin, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Steve Irwin, yeah, for sure. Um, and look, those things do exist, but there's so many other habitats that uh, we get to explore. We have rainforests, we have wetlands, mm. we have snow, we have dense bush, we have all sorts of different habitats. And along with that come a whole lot of different species. So we're very fortunate down here to have so many different birds and so many endemic birds too that don't appear anywhere else. And we're obviously the land of parrots and we sort of take it for granted mm. just how many beautiful, colourful birds. Like you pretty much can't go anywhere in Australia without running into a colourful parrot of some sort. So, mm. you know, whether that's galahs wow. or, um, you know, lorikeets, whatever it is, it's sort of, we're just so fortunate, I guess. And I just got lucky that I'm in a country that has all those species and it doesn't really matter where you go, there'll be birds to photograph. So mm. any town you go, there'll be birds. So And there's often a wetland or a park or a pond or something. So you don't have to go far, which is one massive bonus. I do need to preface that. You don't need to go far to find birds, but to find specific birds, you've got to travel a long way. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. And that's, that's something people underestimate. I get a lot of emails from people going, oh, where's the best place to go birding in Australia? Or where can I go to see X, Y, and Z? And it's like, well, it's very difficult because they're all spread around and mm. it's you can go travel for miles and miles to find a specific bird. So mm. I think we're very lucky in how unique we are and the variety we have, but it's just very challenging and look, I've been in this country for 20 something years and I haven't even been to Western Australia yet. So mm. um, it's my bad, but <laughs> they've got their own birds over there. They've got unique things. And look, I need to get over there and see those birds. So uh, if you do come to Australia, it's just uh, be prepared to travel a lot, um, see lots of good birds, but maybe not all the birds you want to see. So, um, And I think the birds are somewhat, in the built up areas, they're a little bit uh, easier to get close to then there's plenty mm -hmm. of um flighty birds don't get me wrong but um there's definitely from what i hear in some other countries it's very difficult to get anywhere near the birds so yeah um, we probably have that advantage as well so um yeah just the variety i suppose and the different habitats is the big bonus yeah unfortunately we don't have any parrots you know around here in the u.s and uh, those are one of my favorite birds like in costa rica i loved getting to see parrots and macaws and all of that stuff and yes so uh definitely jealous of aspects like that for you in australia and and uh yeah i i think the diversity in australia um, is incredibly cool uh, to see like what I, you know, obviously I haven't, well, I shouldn't say obviously I haven't been there, but um, yeah, uh, definitely someday would love to go and get to experience a little bit of that, that uniqueness. So very cool. I, th I, I think you're, you're always, you're always jealous of what other people have. It's worth <laughs> the grass is greener, isn't it? Like yep. I look at your birds and think, you know, like the cardinal, like this red bird, how cool is that? Mm. We don't get hummingbirds here. So not a single hummingbird wow. in Australia. Oh, so I've never seen that. one. So, you know, you have, I forget how many species you get in the Americas, but there's a lot. So, you know, we don't get those, we don't get woodpeckers here. So there's oh. lots of different birds or families that we yeah. don't get that you get and i'd love to go over there and you get some different shorebirds and so yeah it doesn't matter you know um it's just funny isn't it you always yep. crave what you can't see and uh everyone's the same i suppose that's interesting i didn't know you guys had no hummingbirds over on australia or woodpeckers no, that's incredible wow <laughs> mm. yeah there's d different birds that fill that niche so yep. we get honey eaters that they're not yeah they don't quite right. there's a couple of honey eaters that um are similar but they're completely different and we get yep. tree creepers which kind of are similar to um wood keep uh woodpeckers, woodpeckers yeah. but yeah so obviously just evolution they've yep. found different niches and um, adapted to different things yeah yeah that's super cool so as i always ask to everyone that i interview um if you had to pick one thing what is the single most important thing to your wildlife photography oh i think it's time in the field to be honest mm. I, I think there's no substitute for time in the field uh, we can watch a million youtube videos we can read a million books we can have the best gear but if you haven't got the experience and you're not sure what you're doing out in the field it's it's it only has so much value you really have to put that that into practice so definitely watch youtube definitely <laughs> but um, you know you really need to get out there and have a go and it's not until you put in the hours that things become instinctive like mm, a number of people yep. will say oh Dwayne, why did you do that or why did you do that yeah. and sometimes i don't even know why i'm doing it so i can go to an environment or a habitat 
And before I know what I'm doing, I'm doing it because I can see mm. where the subjects are. I can see what the environment is. I know where the sun is. I can figure I know what my focal length is. This is what the shot's going to look like. This is where I need to be. This is where it's moving. So you need to learn your craft. You need to understand the behavior of the subjects. Where are they going? Similar to your guide in Costa Rica. He knew where everything was. Yep. The more time you have in the field, the better you can predict when things are going to happen. What conditions are uh, best or most conducive to a certain style? For water birds, if there's wind, I'm not going because it just it wrecks mm. the water. You get all this white. I want generally you can go but generally yeah. i want nice flat if you want reflections you got to have no wind mm -hmm. so you know and which ha which visit these places before you go there with your camera are they good for photography you know you can go to ebird and it goes <laughs> oh they've got all these birds and you go there and you're like it's trash for photos yeah <laughs> yeah it's no it's no good for photos so yeah. you've got to do the groundwork you've got to do the leg, leg work so i think like with anything it's just time it's effort and don't be too hard on yourself these you know, we all take bad shots. I take soft shots. I delete a lot and it's taken me years and I still take bad photos. So it's about just getting out there, having fun, learning as you're going and just improving gradually. And before yep. you know it, I, I tell everyone, if you've been maybe a couple of years, go back to some of the first photos you took and have a look at the photos you're taking yeah. now and you'll see the improvement. Yeah. And it's just a continual improvement we can never stop learning um, trying different things backlighting side lighting zoom lenses prime lenses just be creative and and try these different things and uh, be okay with failure so that, that would be my advice is just uh, get out as often as you can and try these things and um, you know just enjoy the process don't be too concerned with the final product yes we want those good photos but don't be too hard on yourself if you don't get what you see online is the tip of the iceberg like people are only going to post their best shots very rarely do you get people posting all their worst shots yeah so you've got this unrealistic top of the iceberg these photos often take people years to get or they've set them up or whatever you're not seeing everything that they've taken underneath so that would be my um advice i suppose or my encouragement yeah i love that you mentioned that and i love that you mentioned um about the looking back at your old photos, because uh, um, yeah, one of to me, some people can kind of view it as you know um, maybe like a disrespect to their old work, or maybe a, I don't know, uh, you know, have a certain sort of feeling about it that could be valid as well. But I really find it encouraging for myself or insp inspiring for myself looking back at my old work and seeing how much better I can shoot now <laughs> and kind of being like, oh, yeah. wow, that it really isn't that great anymore compared to what I know I can do now. And um, that yeah. feeling gives me a lot of uh, satisfaction in knowing that I've grown and I've gotten more creative and improved a lot in my own work. So, well, thanks for being on here today. It was an honor getting to have you on and um, love everything you're doing with the channel <laughs> and um, love everything you represent. So thanks for being here. Oh, it's absolutely my pleasure and I uh, hope everyone enjoyed listening and uh, good luck to everyone out there with your camera and your photos and uh, spread the word and the more people that get into birding, the better. So um, yeah, it was my pleasure. Thank you all for watching. If you'd like to see more from Duade Payton, make sure to head over to his channel in the description below. And to celebrate the launch of Wilder this month, I've been releasing a series of three interviews with prominent wildlife photography YouTubers. So head over to our channel to see the previous interviews if you want to check those out. And make sure you subscribe to our brand new Wilder leaflet in the description below to see Duade's three recommendations on what to look out for in camera gear and to see more on discounts in gear and wildlife photography news. I'll see you guys in the next episode.